Welcome back inside the den. We got a good one for you today. And as always, I'm joined by Chris Murray, and we actually have Mike Stephenson on today um, to talk a little Nevada football now. If you've been living under a rock, there's been some quite some changes around, uh, you know, around the, the world of uh, Nevada. Um, I don't know who, who wants to start, kind of give us mm -hmm. a recap of, uh, you know, f uh, Friday to, to Sunday or, or Monday, rather. Um, just kind of a crazy time for uh, Nevada. Well, yeah, the short uh, version of the story is that uh, Ken Wilson got fired and Jeff Choke got hired. So the Wolfpack has a new head football coach. It was about a 48-hour turnaround from the firing to the hiring. Obviously, it was a weird situation because Nevada kind of had to run out the clock on Ken Wilson's uh, tenure because I think they had more or less made the decision earlier in the week yeah. that they were going to move on. But that buyout dropping from $1.5 million to $1 million on Friday, they make the move Friday morning. Stephanie Ramp said that she did three um, I guess like real interviews and, uh, you know, talk to a, a few other candidates, but it seemed like it was Jeff Choate from the very beginning and that's who it ended up being. If we go back even further, there was so much talk throughout the season on if a move was going to be made or not. And we were speculating how many wins does Nevada need to get to, how much progress needs to be shown to have Ken Wilson keep his job. It turns out it felt like they were far from any of those benchmarks that uh, you had kind of put out there thinking that, all right, Ken might get a third year if this works out. And obviously you had a chance to talk with him before we get into Jeff Choate's introduction. You had a chance to talk with Ken, who was uh, very open with you about just how he felt about it all and how there was a difference of opinion. You really can't fault Stephanie Rent for wanting to hire her own guy. Uh, but Ken Wilson also felt like year three may have been when his Wolfpack program saw a big jump, but unfortunately, There was ammunition for both sides to say, you know, if you're Ken Wilson, I deserve three years. Like, I inherited a terrible situation. I, you know, took this job knowing it was going to be a difficult rebuild. And he was probably promised somewhere along the line that you're going to be given time to fix it. And obviously there's an athletic director change shortly after he's hired. So now you're working for a boss who didn't hire you, doesn't have that skin in the game. And if you're Stephanie Ramp, you're saying two and ten, two and ten, almost literally no progress from advanced metrics. <laughs> Um, you know, I got to make a change here because I'm not going to be able to sell season tickets and keep this community engaged with this program. And it's your most important program because of football's high risk, high reward nature. Even teams that don't put a lot of money into football, they're spending 12, 13 million dollars a year on the product. And they've got to turn a revenue in football or else all the other um, sports on campus are really going to struggle. So, yeah, speaking with Ken, I think he was more or less very positive given the situation. Yeah. Um, you know, I know Nevada means a lot to him. He just wishes that he had a little bit more time and um, wasn't given that time. And, and we'll see if this move ends up being the right decision for Stephanie Ramp. But certainly everybody was really excited yesterday when Jeff Choate was announced. There was a lot of energy in that room over there at Mackey Stadium. Yeah, it speaks to the, the pressing nature of college football to turn around programs faster than it used to be in the past, uh, especially with the, the transfer portal and the NIL era. So um, you see, you know, college football teams throughout throughout the country turn around in, you know, a year or two. Look at what uh, New Mexico State did, um, going into Auburn and, and beating an SEC team. That's impressive, obviously, from a coach that just, you know, was there just a couple years. Um, so I think there's more precedent to, like, you know, try to accelerate programs versus in the past where it's like, uh, we'll give you we'll give you your four years mm -hmm. before we can really tell if uh, this thing's turning around. So, yeah, uh, before we, we talked about, you know, in our prior podcast that, like, you know, the magic number was like four wins. Um, but, you know, they stayed, stayed at two. So no progress, and uh, Remp didn't hire him. So she had to make a change, and it just, just adds up. Kind of felt like that, and she was asked about that, you know, uh, after introducing Jeff Choate, and she said, you know, I wanted to give a full assessment to the program. And again, going back to Ken, there was a difference in opinion of where she thought the program was going versus where he thought it was going. And it does it does suck, frankly, because he's such a Nevada guy and he's always been so kind to us in the media and he's a hell of a football coach, uh, but it just didn't work out as the head man. And it's unfortunate it didn't work out at a place where he you know, quite literally bleed, bleeds silver and blue. I guess not literally, but he might ah, because well, he's been check. here for so <laughs> dang long. Um, but like you said, he went out pretty graciously, had a lot of uh, positive things to say to you. And so now we usher in the Jeff Choate era. And I will say, Ken, outside of the product on the field, gave him a lot of things to be excited about in terms of upgrades in facility and, you know, reestablishing some culture because it really felt like the guys really loved to play for Ken and his staff. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people were probably hurt, but that's what's going to happen when you have a head coach who leaves. I mean, you're going to be buying into that vision. And if you stuck with the program for two years, you probably believe in that vision. You want to carry it out. 
And, you know, now these players have to assess whether Jeff Choate is right for them. Uh, you know, they, they have released Nevada Athletics, you know, some behind-the-scenes footage of him talking to the team. And he's just the kind of guy that is going to get you fired up. Like, Jeff Choate is going to win a press conference. He's going to get you enthusiastic. He's going to get you really thinking in a positive mindset and being optimistic. Um, I think a lot of these players are going to want to play for him, even though it wasn't necessarily the coach they signed up to play for. We'll continue to track the transfer portal. Nevada's got about five guys in there as of – uh, are taping this right now here on a Tuesday. But, um, you know, if I were in those seats uh, and that was a new coach who was walking in, like just as a media member, like, you know, he, he did say a lot of really good things. He really struck the right chord. And all of, you know, the places he's been before have really talked about the relationship building and how good of a, a person he is and how genuine and authentic he is. So I think he's going to do a pretty good job of retaining the top talent on Nevada's roster. But he's going to have to go get a lot more talent because certainly – the, the talent level on the roster, back-to-back two and ten seasons, the proof's in the pudding. Yes, it was a younger team, um, but, you know, you didn't see a lot of growth throughout the year, and I think that was probably what ended up, you know, leading to the decision to fire him. But, um, you know, I've even heard from fans who have seen some of the interview clips that we've put out, and they're really pumped up and excited. So I think they have a lot to sell just in terms of, you know, the initial impression that people have gotten about Jeff Cho. Yeah, he can sell, um, but a little bit behind, uh, you know, more about Cho and, and who he is and where he comes from. Uh, kind of a seasoned college football guy um, from the FBS through the F- FBS ranks. Uh, obviously, formerly coached at Montana State, uh, former Mike Stomping Grounds. <laughs> um, kind of served as an assistant all over, you know, the West Coast and, and through Florida. Kind of said that to you guys at the interview yesterday, saying that, you know, I've been through Spokane, through like Gainesville, you know, like he's touched every single corner of the, of the nation in, in college football. And obviously he uh, serves as a co-defensive coordinator and linebacker coach. Um, I wouldn't say currently. It's kind of like a weird uh, <laughs> state that it's in because he's going to go coach in the college football playoff. But he serves at, at Texas um, under uh, Steve Sarkeesian. Um, but that team is uh, you know, number three in the country, a great team. Um, the uh, linebackers that he's helped produce, uh, maybe somebody that you know people aren't familiar with, uh, Overshone um, from last year's draft. Uh, he's uh, he's a Dallas Cowboy. Kind of got hurt in the preseason, but a good linebacker. Um, so just kind of looking at it from the surface, you know, um, in terms of their of their defense. So like if you look at their run defense, they were number twenty three. Uh, sorry, twenty three total defense in the country. Um, so a good unit. Um, there's only like three teams in the in the Big Twelve that represent uh, the top fifty. Um, so you know, if you think about conferences. The Big 12, that's a lot of scoring. That's a lot of potent offenses. Um, to be ranked so high in number 23 um, speaks to a, a great defensive front and a great defense overall. Um, against the run, they uh, limited players to 2.9 yards per carry. Um, so a good run defense. Obviously, uh, a front four or front five is instrumental in that, um, but your linebackers are obviously going to you know, chip in and help. Um, so just on the field, seems like a good coach. Um, obviously won the press conference, um, but we'll see how he assembles the staff going forward. And that's huge. The staff is huge. Obviously, we feel like the defense will be in pretty good shape because he's a defensive-minded guy. And another linebacker I would bring up from when he was at Montana State is Troy Anderson, who was actually a Montana product, and he was a second-round pick to the Atlanta Falcons. And so he was able to help bolster his stock, and he ended up being an all-time great Montana State Bobcat, which I can – spotlight a little bit of his time in the Treasure State. He actually was hired right after I was leaving. I started my career in Billings, Montana. I was there from 12 to 16. He was hired kind of right as I was finishing up my time there for the outgoing coach, which was Rob Ash. He was actually, he is the all-time winningest coach in Montana State history. He got 70 wins in nine years, but in the nine times they played the Montana Grizzlies, Montana State only won two of those nine games under Rob Ash. And so that, when you, I know you were looking deeper at Rob Ash's tenure at Montana State. On paper, it was pretty dang good outside of that 2-7 and seven record in the Brawl of the Wild, which I think illustrates how important that game is in the state of Montana. I mean, it's been going on for obviously decades and decades. And when Jeff Choate came to town, he played against the Grizzlies four times, and it was four Montana State Bobcat wins. And so from what I hear from my folks that are still back in Montana, Jeff Choate never has to buy a drink again in the town of Bozeman because he is revered there for what he did. And apparently they call him the Grizz Slayer. (laughs) And that is a good reputation to have if you're on the side of the Bobcats. And so he left on his own accord, which I think traditionally might sour some fans. But from what I hear, Jeff Choate is the man in Bozeman, and that, again, was his first head coaching opportunity, and he definitely made the most of it, especially in those last couple years when he got Montana State back to the playoffs, but more importantly, 
beat the Grizz four times. And I asked him about that at the presser. I had to name drop the Grizz Slayer thing in front of everyone just because I thought it was great. And he said, yeah, I noticed that, you know, there's a, a fake cannon in the spot where the real thing's supposed to be. He's like, we need to get that out of there. We need to have a blank space right there, which I totally agree with, uh. to remind the players what needs to be there. And he was quick to say, yeah, we don't wear, we don't wear red a lot in this town. And so uh, he was briefed well. <laughs> also name dropped the union and the little general in his opening statement. Yeah, so, uh, Nevada Grit so also in Nevada there. Nevada Grit <laughs> snuck in, which he's, we were a little surprised He's dropping hear. in. Yeah, I mean, having the head coaching experience, I think, is really big because you want to be able to say, okay, this guy's done it at a previous place. So there's probably a better likelihood that he's going to be able to do it and replicate that success at our place now montana state's a very good program you mentioned rob ash eight of the nine years under him above 500 four playoff berths in the last six seasons leading in to coach choate's uh, tenure with montana state so that's already one of the better fcs programs and certainly coach choate first two years under 500 and then really upgraded things thereafter an eight win season 11 win season their first fcs semifinal um, since 1984 when they did it in 2019 his last year so he was able to build that thing up even to a little bit higher of a level than coach ash had it and like you said he was able to win those rivalry games a different challenge here because not only are you going from fcs to fbs he became a head coach at montana state in 2006 think of everything that's changed since then in college football with the transfer portal with nil impacting how much players are getting and that player movement movement and then also the fact that he's inheriting a program back to back two and ten seasons this is not is. a plum plum situation for him to step into and have a ton of success in year one because even you look at Nevada's schedule next year they've got nine games against bowl teams from this year plus at Minnesota which is a big 10 team that was five and seven plus they're going to get either Oregon State or Washington State on the schedule with this new scheduling agreement so expecting a ton in year one might be outlandish but he does have a really good reputation in recruiting and player development which is hugely important because Nevada is not going to get four-star recruits and they're going to lose talented players at the transfer portal they need to develop players from the high school level and it seems like that's what he wants to do um, but you know th this is going to be a to me, a bigger challenge than what he faced at Montana State. I'm sure there were challenges there, but that already is kind of a top 25 FCS program, whereas Nevada is not. It's a lower-ranked Mountain West program that certainly has had success under Coach Alt, and that's one of the things that really attracted him to this job. You've seen coaches be successful here, whether it was Alt or whether it was Jay Norvell, but you're really building this thing up still from scratch. Yeah, there are some talented players returning, but this roster where it currently is is not even a bowl team, so he's going to have to – you know, he's going to take a couple years. And you look at the contract, you know, the buyout to fire him, uh, a lot more steep than it was with Ken Wilson. So I think he will get that time regardless of who the athletic director is because financially he's got things in place where he's going to get four years because of those buyout numbers. Yeah, I was waiting for him at the press conference to mention uh, Biden kneecaps. Um, he definitely reminds me of, uh, uh, you know, Somebody put it on <laughs> on social media. Walmart brand. Walmart. Uh, Dan Campbell. Uh, I so saw that's, that too. Yeah, that's a that's a yeah that's a funny comparison, but you know that's uh, kind of speaks to like who he might be as a coach, right? A player coach, a uh, a person that galvanizes a team and and can and can push them. And that's the like one of the components of being a college football coach that like, people don't like. You know, you could see stats, you could see all these different things, but you know. Y to be a good coach or a head coach, you have to like learn how to, to rally men or kids in this case, rally the rally the students and you know just basically lead uh, you know lead them and uh, be the person that uh, shepherds a, a good team. Um, so like that's behind the scenes. We don't really get to see that often because we have limited access with, with Nevada. Um, so we can't fairly say that Ken Wilson did or did not do that. Um, but just based on the, the video footage of him talking to the, the, the players, it seems like, you know, he's a born teacher. Um, so that's that's a you know, that's a plus in, uh, you know, in, for him. But um, again, it remains to be seen how this this roster kind of you know, fluctuates in these coming weeks because he is heading back to Texas on December 15th. So he'll be here for 11 days. We're recording on December 4th. 11 more days just to, you know, kind of, you know, get situated, and analyze the coaching staff, analyze the players that are here, and make a pitch to at least the good ones uh, to why they should stay, right? Um, so, uh, and he said to you guys that, you know, this first window of uh, – transfers they might miss out on but come spring that that's when they'll be really active um so we might have to wait till like you know april may yeah. before they're really i mean he's probably yeah. going to have like 11 days to get a staff in place before he goes and focuses on texas's playoff mm -hmm. spots yeah. and then you know that staff that he assembles will kind of lead this team in the recruiting you're talking about the um early signing periods december 20th 
So certainly you want like 10 to 15 players in there. He did say, like you said, that they're not really going to go after a bunch of guys in the early portion of the transfer portal. They'll get through spring camp. They'll assess the roster, have a better feeling for where the strengths and weaknesses are, and then go uh, a little bit more after the transfers in the spring period. You see some changes after spring ball. So he's certainly going to have his plate you know, loaded up. I know there's been some you know, chatter. Well, why isn't his loyalty to Nevada now? Like he's playing for a national championship. Nope, got to go back. Like, I mean, these are kids that you recruited to go win a national championship. So to leave them when they're two games, games uh, away from that goal I think would be you know not speak well to to him I mean Ken Wilson did the same thing he played it out through Oregon and I think people you know were pretty on with that but how how they saw the Ken Wilson era go maybe they changed their mindset but also if you go and you do win a national championship think of what that can mean in recruiting like you can go into households and say I want a national championship at Texas that's the caliber of coaching you're going to get if you come to Nevada so while it's not ideal I think he's 100% making the right decision to see it through with the Longhorns and hopefully they do do, do go out there and win a national championship and um, he gets to celebrate that but uh, you know being able to balance that and build uh, a team here at Nevada at the same time that's going to be 24 hour days yeah I think actually Folks who are sour that he's going back, I think they have it backwards. I think that shows, as you pointed out, more of his loyalty. Like, imagine a coach doing that to Nevada, you know, investing so much time into the Wolfpack and then just bouncing and not finishing the job, so to speak. I think it speaks a lot about his character that he's actually going to stick with Texas, finish out what he started there, and then start his new chapter with the Wolfpack. You said it. He's got some time to figure things out. I have a text thread with Coulter Nuanez, who covers Big Sky Sports, he's based out of Montana. He actually still talks to Coach Choate a few years after Coach Choate left, which I think also says a lot about Jeff Choate and the, the way he likes to build relationships. He did say regarding the staff that he speculates that Jeff Choate might try to dip into some of the guys that are at Boise State, where he, of course, has a decent amount of history with the Broncos. Be curious to see if any guys jump within the Mountain West and come from Boise State down to Nevada. Keep an eye on that. He also said, one piece of advice I'll give you about Choate. If you ever get sideways with him, <laughs> just call him or go see him and let him rip your head off. <laughs> <laughs> one of his best traits is that he does not hold grudges if he knows you can take a brow beating. There so we go. That's a word of advice look, for all look, of us. Looking forward to, to some brow beatings. <laughs> I mean, I kind of like that. You're not always going to have like 100% the best relationship with the people you cover. There's right. going to be some ups and downs. But for me, I always do like a, a phone call from that coach or that player to, you know, hash through those things rather than have – you know, a secondary person make that call on someone's behalf because you're not really getting to the bottom of things. And, uh, you know, Stephanie Rem said he can run hot sometimes. And, you know, he's obviously a very um, passionate guy. And sometimes I'm sure those emotions will, will get the better of him. And, um, you know, uh, there might be some fun conversations. But he does seem like a really genuine guy. He seems like a really down-to-earth guy, certainly, you know, from humble, small roots. Uh, he's from a small town in Idaho. Um, you know, was a high school coach and athletic director for six years before he even got into the college ranks. So, I mean, he kind of came from nothing, not to, you know, speak ill of, of the city that he's from. Right. But, um, you know, he didn't come from a big town. He hasn't had anything handed to him. So I think he's, you know, used to working really hard for what he gets. And, and now he's got this opportunity as an FBS head coach. That's what everybody wants to do. That's why he left Montana State to go to Texas. He wanted to be an FBS head coach. And it'll be very interesting from the motivation factor. This is a guy who was a runner-up for Boise State in 2021 when they hired Andy Avalos. He was a runner-up again in this cycle when they maintained their interim head coach, Spencer Danielson. So um, Nevada-Boise State, already a huge rivalry. Coach Choate was at Boise State for six years as an assistant coach. And you know he's going to want to beat those Broncos because that's a job he wanted. And they didn't believe enough in him to give him that job. And I know he expressed, um, you know, his uh, love for this opportunity and how thankful he was to get this job. So, you know, Nevada is scheduled to play Boise State next year. And I think that's going to be a really fun game. Get your popcorn ready. One thing I will add before we go back to you, Jared, is you asked him about what he learned being a head coach at Montana State. And Steph said he can run hot. But he did say, I've realized not everything is a big thing, right? Some things I can learn to let go or maybe not get so fired up about. So it sounds like... He's got a lot of experience, obviously, with leading the Bobcats, but more perspective out of that and how to run uh, an organization, if you will. I think that's actually how he put it, and I think he's excited to really grab the Wolfpack uh, by the horns, if you will. Uh, no, no pun intended with the Texas reference there, but and really just kind of create his own um, his own culture with Nevada. And I know he expressed that his wife Janet's also really excited to be a part of that too, and um, the Choate family on en route to the biggest little city. Pretty cool. Yeah, uh, and the experience is, is, you know, the ultimate teacher. Um, you know, 
you know, we we saw with Ken, he, he, he served as a career assistant and then first time head coach, right? Um, but for at least with Cho, he, he's done it before. And then he went to a up and coming Texas program, not program, but like a resurgent program um, under Sarkeesian. So like, you know, he, he can learn from that, but he also understands like, hey, I've been in his shoes before. I, I know what he's thinking. And if I do this again, this is how I'll do it. So, you know, it can't, it, it won't be exactly the same as his time at Montana State because um, he faces these challenges. But a big thing that, you know, like, you know, we talked about before with the struggles of this Nevada football team in 2023 was their lack of identity, both, you know, on offense and, and sometimes on defense, uh, but mainly on offense. You're like, well, what are they going to do? You know, like, I don't, I can't put my, like, you know, thumb on the pulse, um, but he laid it out <laughs> right away. We had a clip that went uh, like semi-viral, um, hundreds of thousands of views. Um, but, you know, he he uh, he said, he's like, here's what we're going to do. He's like, we're going to run the damn ball. You know, we're going to have great defense, uh, elite special teams. But then he, he did go on to admit, you know, it's like it depends on the personnel ultimately. Um, but, you know, it, it fired some uh, Nevada fans up and made them run, want to run through a wall. Um, but at least, you know, he's outlined a form of identity, and that is a positive moving forward. Now, can they do it with this current offensive line? We'll see how they can rebuild it. Um, that was a weak point last year. Um, but, you know, it remains to be seen. They're going to run the damn ball. Run the damn ball. He did say it starts with the union, which yeah. is another buzzword. He had to get in, right? I mean, they ran the ball 65% of the time at Montana State. So proof is in the pudding there. They want to run the ball. They want to establish the run. They want to play great defense. He was a special teams coordinator at a number of his stops, including at Boise State, at Washington, at Florida. So this is a guy who – Knows his special teams very well. He's used to interacting with the whole team. It's not just, you know, special teams. You're working with offense and defense and bringing them together. So, uh, you know, there are major questions about the offense. And we got some questions, you know, why didn't they go and hire an offensive coach if that was the problem? Like, you just go get the post best coach possible, and you hope that he can fill out the offensive staff. So it'll be very interesting to see who the offensive coordinator is. I know people have thrown around Nick Rolovich's name. People, uh, Wolfpack fans, seem to not be able to quit. Coach Rolovich, yeah, but I mean, Rolo, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do a, an air raid offensive coordinator with a run oriented offense. So, um, you know, this is going to be a run first team. They are going to try and run the ball 65% of the time. You've seen successful teams do that in the Mountain West. That's what San Diego State did, is they won three Mountain West championships. That's the template over there at Wyoming, which has been a very successful program. I think they've made a bowl or been bowl eligible six of the last seven years. So, um, that's the, the formula you're probably going to see is like a San Diego State. Wyoming kind of team. It's very different than Jay Norvell. Uh, maybe not quite as exciting offensively, but the whole goal is to win games, and um, I don't think he'll veer too far away from what he did at Montana State. You buried the lead of those first two years at Montana State. One of his top athletes was yes. the quarterback, top rushers by the name of Chris Murray. Yes. <laughs> no so, relation. Starting, yeah, starting quarterback <laughs> and top rusher, Chris Murray. Yeah, three of his four years uh, there, the top rusher was a quarterback. Yeah. So, I mean, you look at Brendan Lewis and A.J. Bianco. Those are your two kind of returning quarterbacks. We'll see if they do return. But th they've got some, you know, athleticism. Both those guys can run the ball. So there's probably a system fit there. Um, but you're going to see a pretty massive roster turnover. Probably by the end of, of this spring camp, there might be like five to ten guys left from the Jay Norvell era, which is pretty crazy. Is You're talking about basically two years in a spring camp, and your roster's been completely flipped around. So, um, you know, we'll see exactly what the roster looks like, but I, I think there's going to be a lot of work put into that. There has to be. It's, it's just not a good enough roster right now, even though there are some good young players, and specifically the offensive line. Like, the offensive line at Nevada has not been elite since 2012 when Chris Alt resigned. There's been some good players. Obviously, you got a Joel Batoni have got an Austin Corbett, but a dominant elite offensive line with multiple all-conference honorees. That was the standard under Chris Alt, basically his entire uh, tenure at Nevada. We've not seen that the last decade. And you've had about 10 different offensive line coaches since 2009. So that constant turnover, also not good. But um, can he build up that offensive line is a big question. Yeah, can Jeff bring some stability? The third Jeff, as you discovered, to lead the Wolfpack, top of the name power rankings, if you will. In the FBS era, you've FBS, got three, yes. three Jeffs and two Chris's. You've got a Jay, a Ken, and a Brian. But you've got <laughs> Jeff Tisdell, uh, Jeff Horton, and now Jeff Choate. So the third Jeff. We'll see Not how Jeffs. he does. Um, another uh, point I want to point out is, uh, you know, Jay, naturally, he, he also uh, coached at Texas prior to, uh, you know, coming to Nevada. Um, but... In doing so, he he went back and and I believe he recruited some players out of Texas, correct? Oh uh, yeah, he got a so couple of guys. Couple. Well, could, could Cho like you know like kind of pull from that like uh, that area? I mean, Austin is a a big hub of uh, a 
really good high school athletes. Um, but, you know, that kind of expands. He talked about wanting to recruit in Northern California and that California area. Um, but you don't almost have to think, like, maybe he established some relationships. Um, maybe not <laughs> not quite with the four- or five-star guys, but, like, with the kind of lower-level guys in, in the Texas region that he could recruit and pitch. Um, that's definitely a benefit, um, potentially having that. Um, but to shift gears for a second, um, Stephanie Remp did say at the uh, – the, the presser that uh, they are building an indoor field house. Uh, it's been said before. <laughs> Those words have been heard before. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, it's it's going to happen eventually, right? It has I to. Actually, In our I, lifetime? I, I think we, uh, Shannon may have put out a tweet, and I think someone said, yeah, 1995 facilities called. Like, that That was like 25 years ago. You should have had that. <laughs> I mean, there was some progress being made under the Coach Wilson staff. They were raising the money to get that done. And it was getting some headway. Um, I think she's saying it more like declaratively, like we're going to get this done. Not we have the money and we're doing it now. And here, let let me explain when it, you know groundbreaking and all that. Yeah, yeah. I think it was more you know uh, abstract that we're going to get this done for him. But I sh I'm sure they told him in the recruiting pitch, like we'll get you an indoor facility within the next three or four years. You know how many times I've heard that in the 22 years <laughs> I've covered this this uh, area, a lot. Here's I think one I think one will be done in the next five years, but I don't think it's like. Uh, you know, here's the plan, and we're going to go do it yeah. right now. Well, and I believe one was built in Bozeman during Choate's yeah. tenure. I think you asked him about it, and he said that was a big thing. Obviously, super cold but weather what climate. What does that say? You have Montana an FCS program doing it, and Nevada's not been able to do it. Oh, I mean, yet. I've been in their facility. Montana State's facilities are better yeah. than Nevada's facilities. So it is like, super nice. And that's what it gets back to the investment in Nevada football, because they've invested in men's basketball, and you've seen success. Yeah. We got the contract for Jeff Choate. Uh, he's making the most ever for a Nevada football coach, right around $1.15 million over uh, the next five years per year. But that's still 10th out of 12 Mountain West head coaches. The assistant salary pool, which is always bottom two or three in the Mountain West, Stephanie Remp said not going to be a big bump. He kind of knows what he's working with. If you want a big increase, you need to sell more season tickets. You need to get more donations. Certainly the facilities have improved, but they're not at the top of the Mountain West. So, um, you know, he's got to get this community behind, uh, you know. And the interesting thing is he's coached three games at Mackey Stadium, and they're all sellouts because they're all Nevada Boise State games. So he kind of thinks that's what Nevada football is. That's true. <laughs> but, like, we've seen the games without Boise State. Uh, it's not usually full. So his whole charge is to get Nevada football to that level because he's seen it happen. But to be able to build the facilities and to, you know, have the assistant pool, you know, Mackey needs 15,000 season ticket holders, not the seven, you know, 7,500 they have now. And the only way you do that is by winning games. That's why people have invested in men's basketball, because they've seen the success and they want it sustained. So you have to build a winner before you get those donations and that financial support. So um, you know, he's got two or three years to do that. And will there be an indoor facility? I guess she said it's going to happen. So I'll take her word, yeah, I'll take her word for <laughs> it. She seemed pretty confident. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, guys, for joining uh, me and Inside the Den. Um, obviously, we'll be tracking the Cho era. Um, throughout the years to come. Um, but it'll be exciting to see, obviously, spring spring football kind of around the corner. You know, it's, it may seem far out, but <laughs> it's it coming quick. Um, but, you know, any final thoughts prior, prior to our uh, leaving? Uh, I mean, I think the general uh, thought is don't be too excited year one. Let, let things play out a little bit. And, yeah, I'm excited to see. You know, it sounds like spring is when they'll really ramp things up in terms of hitting the transfer portal and bringing people in. So, I mean, the next few weeks will be fascinating as far as the staff goes. And then, you know, slowly but surely a roster will be built. We'll, uh, we'll see who sticks around in terms of coaches and players and who comes in. But, yeah, either way, it's a new era of Nevada football, and it started out pretty – uh, pretty splendidly, if you will, with Coach Cho just really owning that press conference. Yeah, my final thought is Florida State got screwed. Bama shouldn't have been in the top four. So I, I don't know where you're at, Chris Alt, but come on, man. Come on. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Coach Alt, who knows? Uh, I know he's not allowed to publicly talk about College Football Selection Committee since he's on it, but I was very disappointed that Florida State went undefeated through the That's ACC, good, right? scheduled two SEC schools in non-conference away from home, won a preseason top five team in LSU, also Florida, and uh, did not get a college football playoff berth. So not related to Nevada, but I wanted to get yeah. that off my chest. Well, just, just, justice, justice for uh, Florida State. <laughs> Hopefully. I don't know. But uh, thank you again for joining us inside the den. We'll be ne back next time, probably talking about Nevada basketball since uh, the season's over. But we'll see you next time.